Let's open our books to page 43. We'll need a little help this morning. I don't remember exactly where we left off. <laughs> Did somebody actually mark that? I, I think we were... I'm not remembering that we did the true and false, so where we were ready to go, okay. So I'm not, I'm not gone yet, but I'm pretty close to it. Okay, we want to wrap up this uh, activity page this this morning and try to get into the next lesson. Um, see how long it takes us, but we certainly want to go over these thoughts. Uh, they say, they, the experts, I guess, say that repetition is one of the best forms of teaching, so we keep going over this stuff, hopefully it's going to sink in. As we begin this morning, let's pause and have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our activities. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for every day that you give us. We're especially thankful that this is the Lord's day. And we pray that as we come together today that we'll have no other purpose but to serve thee and glorify thee and to help to build up one another. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with us. We know that you have provided for us in every way, that you have made plans for us to be part of your family, and we pray, Father, that we'll always evaluate these great blessings and the benefits of being in Christ and count them of great value and hold them in high esteem and make sure we conduct ourselves accordingly. We pray, Father, you be with us today as we study from thy word. We pray that we will gain those things that will help us to be stronger. We pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over us as a congregation of people. We ask the special prayers on those who are struggling with their health and who need our prayers at this time and those who have other difficulties in their lives. We pray that we'll always look to thee for a source of comfort and guidance and strength. We pray, Father, you will forgive us of our sins. We realize we fall short so many times of what we need to do. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to overcome those things that get in our way, those sins that seem to get us off the, the path we need to be on, and help us to be uh, the kind of people that stand ready to repent of those things that are missed in our lives. We pray, Father, that you will continue with us today, will be with us in our worship service. In the days ahead, help us as we live in this difficult world to not be conformed to it or become part of it, but to set the example forth of Christ living in us each day of our lives. Continue with us in our lives, watch over and care for us, and help us, Father, live in such a way that heaven can be our home. We ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. We're trying to address the concept of never giving up. And we've talked about a number of things. We were about to get into true and false. And hopefully these questions will stimulate your thinking, make you think, um, uh, contemplate, consider, uh, spend some time dwelling upon them. True or false, <clears throat> God does not want anyone to give up. That's true. He wants us to succeed. His plans are for us to succeed. Um, as we read the scripture, they're full of uh, encouragements, of direction, of guidance that tell us how we can be successful. And if we will abide with what we have and find in the scriptures, we will be successful. Maybe not in the, the world's thinking in terms of uh, what success is, but in terms of what God considers success. And that's what's important. He does not want anyone to give up. So if you see yourself as, as 
be coming down or you think you're all alone, you're never alone. God is always with us. And uh, we need to understand that and try to, to be encouraged by that and not ever give up. Number two, neither the devil nor any person can make you give up. True or false? True. You give up when you decide to give up. Now, circumstances may really weigh you down. It may just feel like, you may feel like your burden is too great. But you make that decision. Uh, no one is forcing you to give up. Uh, we talked about, about three or four weeks ago, now I guess, when you go on the athletic field, court, basketball, football, whatever it is, you will be challenged, no doubt. And you will be pushed because you're there to try to um, get yourself in a condition where you can compete. And if you've never done that, you don't have that experience. But if you've ever done that, you know how hard it can be and how much you're pushed. The idea there is the coach is not necessarily wanting you to give up. He hopes you succeed because if you succeed through what they throw at you, you have improved, you are a better person, you are someone that can now be depended on. The person that gives up cannot be depended on. And when you get into uh, the difficulties, that's where we need to know who we can count on, right? And so that's, that's what we need to understand. If, if, some, if we give up, that's our decision. No one can force us to do that. And so we need to understand that we can't blame it on somebody else. Well, I couldn't do this because of somebody else. We can throw those out there, but that's not the ultimate decision. It's up to you. Number three, when discouraged, we can turn to the church for solace. True. Um, we should be that family that's always encouraging one another, putting our arms around each other, saying, you can do this, you, you can make it. Um, we have a common goal. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to accomplish the same thing. This should be our, our place of, of refuge. This should be our place of be, knowing we're gonna get support, that we're struggling the, the world or temptations or whatever. This is where we should know that we're going to have brothers and sisters that are going to help lift us up. And so, yes, the church should be there to support us when we're discouraged. And, and there's something that needs to be said here, I think. Um, that I don't know exactly what all is going on in your life. Um, so the point is we have to communicate. If I talk to you on a regular basis and get that opportunity, I can come to understand what's bothering you, what, what, what's discouraging you. And perhaps I can you know, offer some words of encouragement. Um, the problem that we have, and I don't think we can do anything about it unless you start treating us like cattle, but by the time the uh, the the prayer is said, and you can get back to some people, 75 to 80 percent of the people are gone. It's hard to talk to people. You, you have to find the time. So the, I, I'm just making the point that if, if you're discouraged, if you come in here and you come in here right when the services start, and you sit down, and then you leave as soon as the, you have the, the first opportunity, How's anybody going to know what kind of discouragement you're experiencing or the problems that you're having? So we have to communicate with one another. I'm having this problem. This is what's going on in my life. You know, can you help me? We, we have to communicate. And so uh, sometimes we, we don't deal with discouragement very well because we don't share with the church and those that we, we know are struggling in, in like manner. So keep that in mind. We need to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Exactly.
Yeah. There's not a limit on the number of people. Absolutely not. It, the, the, the idea that we just already talked about, God doesn't want anybody to fail. He wants everybody to succeed. Heaven is a place that's prepared, and if God prepared it, God's going to make it where there's plenty of room. There's not a problem with that. We're not competing with one another. And so, and sometimes we, we uh, have the tendency that, well, I don't want people to know about my problems, and, you know, I'll take care of myself. Well, there are, <clears throat> there are things we can take care of. It's like Galatians chapter 6. Uh, if you start reading there, there are things that we can take care of. We're supposed to take care of, but there are things that we can't take care of. They, they become uh, a burden too great for us, and we need help. And so we need to, to learn to help one another. And we need to be the kind of people that are receptive to helping people. Um, so we just need to be aware as, as best we can the problems that if, you know, people are having and what can we do to encourage them or help them. Number four, prayer is never mentioned in connection with our Lord's life. False. We find him in prayer so many times. So many times. And the interesting thing is, to me at least, when you think of, of Jesus, the Son of God, you don't think about weaknesses, do you? You don't think about him being discouraged. He's the Son of God. He knows what's going to happen. He knows um, what the plan is. He knew what he, when he came here what his life was going to be about. And although those around about him didn't understand, he always knew what was going to happen. He knew what, knew what he was uh, here for and his purpose. And, and yet, we see him discouraged at times. Um, so he was in prayer. He would pray. He prayed for things uh, on a number of occasions. We see Jesus in prayer. And so... Um, that's, that's false. Prayer is commonly mentioned and associated with Jesus. And, and prayer, the reason this point is being brought up is that prayer can help us. Prayer is an avenue to help us uh, to talk about what we're struggling with. And Jesus, we know, is uh, understanding, tempted in all points like as we were. And so he knows what it takes uh, to help encourage you. He knows the difficulties you're going to go through. So we need to talk to God in prayer through Jesus Christ. Because these are, these are beings that care. And we need to understand that. Number five, we should love this nation and our flag and should pray for our future. I think that's true. I mean, that's what the book says, and we, you know, we're filling in the blanks. But uh, yeah, we, this is this is the country we live in. It's it's our country. Um, it's a country that needs support. It needs some help. Uh, we have some great difficulties in this country. People's attitudes and people's thinking on things, and uh, some of the things that are going on. It just uh, you know, it just really scrambles the brain to try to put your arms around them. They're just, they're strange. They're foreign to us. And um, we're, we're not where we need to be in terms of recognizing God and God being in the lives of the people of America. And it's, it's getting worse. And so, you know, this country needs our prayers. It's a, it's a great country. Um, you hear people say it's the, the greatest country on the, on the earth. Um, and, you know, somebody might argue with that. But the privileges that we have, the freedoms that we have, they didn't come without great cost. And you don't abandon those. You try to embrace those and hold on to them. For whatever reason it is, internally, we have so many people, and maybe it just seems that way because of what the media does with throwing it out there on every kind of uh, media that we have, especially with the internet nowadays, we see what's going on with people. They're, they're upset. They're, you know, they're, they're doing things that are wrong. And, you know, we, we're not getting any better, is the point I'm making. Until we can turn things around and to start to get 
ourselves back to what our founding fathers initially uh, intended, that we would be a God-believing people and that we would follow after rules and principles that supported what we find in the Bible, we, uh, we're going to struggle. But we always need the prayers to make this country uh, what, what it needs to be. And it takes effort. It's not just going to happen um, on its own. All right. Five simple questions. Is it ever right to ask, why me, Lord? And then he says, give two examples. So, is it ever right to ask, why me, Lord? Yes or no? Yes, according to what he has, and I think he has a valid point. What does he give us two examples? Why have you been so good to me? Um, David used to, would say in his writings, um, what is man that, they're mind, that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou made us a little lower than angels and clothed us and, and give, gave us what we need. Why are you so good to us? We typically don't hear that kind of question asked. We hear, usually hear, why did God let this happen? And that's what a lot of people, that's the way they think. They don't think, well, why has God been so good to us? And when you, <clears throat> when you look at the, 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 the writing of the book of Job, and you look at Job's difficulty, and, and Job would not curse God. God, uh, he looked at God, and, you know, blessed be the Lord. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you look at what you have, and you weigh it against the difficulties of life that pull us down, if you were to count them by measure, how many good things happen to us versus how many bad things happen to us. And we, we all know the answer to that. It way outweighs, the good things way outweigh the bad things. But yet our tendency is to think in terms of, this is bad, I'm discouraged. And so we need to, to think about that. Why has God been so good to me? That's a good question to ask. And what's the next one he points out? What have I done to deserve this? What have I done to deserve this? If you can, and I, and I, <clears throat> I struggle with this. I don't think we can ever totally put our arms around what God has done for us. But if you, as we read last week, about God not sparing his son, if you could understand that someone took your place, Someone took your place because of the love of God. God was willing to send His only begotten Son to die for us, to take our place. What do we do to deserve that? We can't say, well, I'm just such a good person that God would want to do that for me. Now, if anything's pointed out that we should understand in, in the book of Romans, and there's so many things, but we should understand there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And since we're sinners, and that means we are rebelling against God, why would God do that? Romans chapter 5, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet Enemies. We were the enemies of God. Jesus died for us. So, what did we do to deserve this? We don't deserve this. We deserve punishment. But God has given us a way out. So, whenever you're discouraged, think about what the creator of this universe and who has put everything into motion has done for you. And if he had done that for you, we need to try to overcome discouragement and not give up. Number three, what kind of morals do we often see in society? Barnyard. 
does that immediately invoke in your minds a certain understanding of that? Well, I mean, in the barnyard, you basically have <clears throat> um, just nature's uh, animals being doing what they want to do. And that's, that pretty much describes us. I think barnyard here in this case, as he <clears throat> uses it, probably has a, a very negative connotation because of you think of the barnyard maybe being filthy, uh, not a place you want to be. And that's the way the world has become. Um, we could just uh, totally turn everything off we can at least try to do this. Turn everything off. Not watch our television sets. Not turn on the radio. If I were to ask you, what's the number one thing? Well, maybe you could give me the top two. If you listen, let's say, to country music, what are the two things that the song's going to probably be about? It's coming out in today's world. You look at all your modern artists. Alcohol's number one. And the other one is sex. And if you, if you listen to the top vote-getting artists, if you've watched any of these award shows, what are their, their drinks? I mean, drinks. What are their, what are their songs about? It's like um, any of them. You, you just pick one of them. What's it about? Well, it's drinking. Let's drink. Let's get drunk. That's the mentality. That, that's all the top songs. You know, pick an artist. You won't find too many that will sing just a good old down song that's okay, that's got some good lyrics to it. Those artists are going by the wayside. What people want, apparently, <clears throat> is let's talk about drinking. Let's drink. I have never <clears throat> in my life come to an understanding uh, of this. <clears throat> I just can't get my, I can't comprehend it. Um, if I were to, <clears throat> if I were to every conversation that we had, and I say just back in the four-year, just greeting one another, <clears throat> and, and I'm just going to use this example because you'll see the, <clears throat> how ridiculous it is. Um, but let's just, just say we, ha we have a conversation. I come to meet somebody and come start talking to them. How's it going? How's it? Well, I wish I had a glass of tea right now. I, I just need tea, you know. And, and everybody you talk to, you talked about, well, if I had a tea right now, I'd feel so much better. Now, if I said that to you in all of every conversation I carried on, you'd say, what's the deal about tea? I mean, yeah, tea's nice. I mean, it's a good drink. You have it with your meals. It's refreshing. You know, ice cold glass of tea tastes good. But if I brought that up in every conversation, you would say, there's something wrong with that person. But the world's like that. I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe I just walk around in the, in the, in the wrong places. My office mate, Whenever something comes up that he has to deal with, that's a, uh, whether it's his having to deal with his wife at home or something that's going on there at work, he says, my philosophy is drink heavily. And, and any time something comes up, it's about beer. How, is, how do we get to a point where a beverage is our life? I just don't understand that. If, if, if I walked around and talked to you about tea all day long, you'd say, is he in the tea business? You know? Why does he talk about tea? But people in the world talk about drinking all the time. I don't understand it. If your life and everything that you say has to do with drinking beer or alcohol, where are we headed? If every song that we sing here on the radio is about drinking and partying, where, where are we headed? That's all our young people are hearing. So where are we headed? In the wrong direction. 
That's for sure. So when you talk about barnyard morals, man, we're, we're, we're feeding the nation with that kind of mentality. I, I mean, I, I don't understand it. You, you walk into a meeting, you're fixing to sit down, and people are sitting across the table, and how's it going? Jack? Wish I had a beer right now. It's like, what, what's that got to do with anything? I don't, I can't, I can't comprehend that. What do you mean? If it was up to you, I guess you'd have uh, a glass of beer with you all day long and you would drink. I, like the guy I, I, that works in my office, I talk, he, he says, well, you know, I had about eight last night. Like, what? I, I, I don't understand that. If you can explain it to me, in some terms I can understand. I, I, I just can't understand how people's lives is built around that. But it must be because that's all they ever talk about. And I'm not exaggerating. I hear that so many times in just casual conversations that that comes up. It's like, are we in the beer making process here in this nation? Is that what we're all about? Apparently, according to some people. So when you talk about barnyard morals, you're talking about just those uh, things that animals would do, the reactions of, of animals and how they conduct their lives. Number four, what should be a little bit of heaven on earth? The church. I'm not sure what to say about that. I want to, I want to say that, that it is. It certainly should be. But I'm afraid there are times when we have to say shame on us. Because we're not what we need to be. We ought to be a loving, caring group of people that care about everybody. And yet there's times when we have our factions and we have our divisions. We want our way. And so when the church is what it should be and it's acting as it should, it doesn't get any better than this. And we've got to learn to act like we're supposed to. We're going to have to grow up some. Number five. Since God is in control, what personal thoughts and emotions of yours is he able to hear and see? If you look at Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 5, it's referenced there. The, the basic idea is that he hears our prayers and he sees our tears. And once again, that's, that's something that's just, just hard, to, hard to fathom. Why does God care about me? I don't understand that. But the scriptures are clear that he does. So he, he, he hears me when I pray. And he wants me to be his child. And that's the way he's going to direct me. If I'm praying for things that, well, I hope I get it. You know, I want a new car or I want a new house, or I want this, or I want that. Those prayers are not what God is going to respond with. Well, yes, you get this. He's not a genie. The concept of rubbing the, 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 the lamp, the genie comes out and says, well, my wish is to have a million dollars. You've seen that commercial where the, the Geico commercial said, well, yeah, Geico saves you 15, or can save you money in 15 minutes, and and the person says, well, everybody knows that. I said, well, did you know that genies are quite literal? And so the guy says, he gets a lamp, he, he rubs it, genie comes out, and he says, I'd like to have a million bucks. Man, that's what most of us would say, right? Well, he looks out his window, and there are a million deer bucks. The guy's wish. But, I mean, isn't that what we're about when we want to pray to God? We aren't praying the spiritual things, the things that are needing in our lives, we're wanting more wealth or we're wanting things to go our way or something like that. 
But God is there to hear our prayers and see our tears. The Bible is clear that God cares. And if we have difficulties, that's who we need to take it to. But we need to be willing to change our lives to conform to his will. He's not going to answer us when we live in rebellion. He'll hear our prayers, but our prayers will either go unanswered or they'll go uh, with something that we aren't wanting. All right. Any additional thoughts for never giving up? All right, let's move over to page 44. It's a one lesson in this book that um, I've been apprehensive ever since I looked the book over months ago. Not that the scripture's not clear on it, but because of the world's influence, we don't want to believe it. And the sad thing is that even within the body of Christ, there are those who will fight and will argue about at least two or these three things. We're pretty much come to the conclusion we don't need to do drugs. But we have problems with tobacco and alcohol. And I don't know. There are just times when there are things you wish you didn't know about people. If you look at this lesson from the perspective of what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll turn over and look at that and get ourselves started here this morning. And we'll try to... I think we can talk enough about this today and next week that we'll probably finish up next week. I don't know if we'll get to the activities uh, until the following week, but the idea of teaching lessons like this is not to chastise you or myself or step on our toes. We just want to look at what the scripture says about it and come to an understanding of how we should view the things that the world does and listen to some of the warnings that have come not only from Scripture, but from people who've had their lives ruined by these three things, or any one of these three things. When you think about what Paul says to the Corinthian brethren in identifying our bodies as the temple of God, I want to think just a few moments this morning before the bell catches us about the temple. Now, when you think about the temple, what did it take to go into the temple? What could be brought into the temple? Could anyone just go into the temple? And those that could go into the temple, what kind of preparation did it take for them to go into the temple? They had to be cleansed. <clears throat> Those people that went in had to cleanse themselves. The idea there of purifying themselves, those things being in the temple, being sanctified. They're special. They're there for the reasons that they need to be there, the, for the purposes that they're there. The cleansing, the sanctification that took place. And so, as we look at our bodies as the temple of God, Let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 
and then we'll talk a little bit more about this. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And I understand the idea of the spirituality and what we put into our bodies uh, of a spiritual nature. And so we put those things in a rod, those things that, according to the Scripture, we don't th put strange things in, in our minds and bodies um, and, and try to have competing, as it were, uh, values. For example, we not, we're not going to worship devils and, we're, and worship God. We're not going to uh, be partakers of those, uh, those truths, or not truths, but those ideas that are out there that would be contrary to what God wants us to understand as truth. So I can't, for example, be following God and following Buddha or following some other religious belief. I need to follow what God says. So I understand the idea of that temple and the spiritual aspect. But look at verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So we need to recognize that we have this body. This body is the temple of God. The spiritual being of God would help uh, dwell within us. And that's uh, another concept that's not just easily grasped. But picture, as it were, God putting his spirit in us when we become his children. And we have within us the spirit of God. Paul talks about that, the spirit of God, uh, listening to our spirit and uh, having there a relationship in other writings that he has. So when you think about that, we need to keep the temple ready to be able to worship. So we don't put things in there that defile. And when you think about um, being under the influence of something, not being in uh, clear mind, then the difficulty is there in trying to uh, worship God and focus on those things that we need to focus on. So we look at those things and we, we look at them in terms of are they, are they pure? Are they sanctified? Are those things that should, from a, a physical standpoint as we think about the temple of the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, up until the time of the church, were those the things that, that attention being, being spent on what goes into the temple and making sure that it was appropriate and authorized by God. So when we look at things, we talk about our bodies being the temple, we need to think about it in terms spiritually, what we put in our bodies, but also physically, what do we do to destroy the temple? If people came into the temple and brought things that were not authorized, it was an abomination. It was something that... Um, caused great concern. If people were to come in and try to destroy the temple, <coughs> excuse me, that would have been of great concern. So when we think about our bodies being the temple of God, we need to think about are there things that we need to avoid so that we don't defile our bodies. And that's where we look at with these, these three things. Um, we're going to talk about some statistics. We're going to talk about some passages that talk about how we need to keep ourselves as good as we can. We're going to talk about, um, like I said, some quotes from people that uh, have something to say about alcohol and tobacco and drugs and um, so we we have yet again um, some difficulties that are going around this country at this point in time 
there are a number of states that are looking to legalize marijuana. I understand that marijuana, as they, as they talk about it, has some medicinal purposes, can be used. Um, if that, let me just say this, if the limitation on marijuana use were to be restricted to medical purposes only, um, that's something we'd have to consider. Um, is it, does it have benefits? Maybe it does. Uh, our doctors prescribe things for us sometimes for pain and other things. Uh, and quite frankly, you know how those drugs are. They can be, you know, make you woozy, you know, make you maybe not 100% yourself. But the idea is to benefit you through this period. Well, the legalizing of marijuana in these states, how can you govern that? All you have to do is get um, someone to say you need it for medicinal purposes. I don't know how strict they are, but I'm going to tell you what. You can find a doctor today that will write you a prescription for pain medication when you don't need it. You can. That's not difficult to do. And it will be easy that if you have a doctor who believes that marijuana is beneficial when he may even use it himself on occasion, that he would dole out the prescriptions if that's what it required for you to get some at the, in the states that say that they legalize marijuana. I would venture to say that marijuana is going to become the next tobacco in this country. We will not stop at using it for medicinal purposes. We will, we will legalize it to the point of where you can buy it just like you buy cigarettes. I'm not a prophet, but I know how people are. Most drug users that are hardcore drug users, years ago, maybe not today because we've got some new manufactured drugs on the street, but years ago, most of the drug users started out with marijuana. So we have to ask ourselves, are these things right for our body? And when we start getting into things that alter our minds and keep us from being sharp and alert, these things are going against what God intends for us as Christians. We need to be focused, we need to be aware and making decisions based on what the scriptures teach. So as we get into this study, it's difficult for me because I realize there are people who have views totally against what the scriptures say. And we're going to get arguments like, where does the word tobacco show up in the Bible? Hmm. You're not going to find it. Where does marijuana show up in the Bible? Where do all the drugs that we use today show up in the Bible? They don't. But when we look at what God says that we should do with ourselves and how we should carry ourselves and the things that we should do as Christians... I believe we're going to see scriptures that are going to speak against these things. All right, next week we'll pick up here and um, see how far we get.